It turned. As quickly and smoothly as he could, he opened the door and slipped behind it. Ninja, he thought to himself. <laughs> yeah, Fortnite ninja. Um, Colton found himself in a small storage room illuminated by a single low wattage light bulb. There was a rack of mops and brooms. Large yellow plastic buckets on wheels were lined up against the nearest wall. In front of the back wall was a tall grey metal cabinet with double doors. Could he hide inside the cabinet? Colton opened one of the doors. The cabinet was lined with shelves stocked with cleaning supplies and rolls of paper towels and toilet paper. There was no room to hide. But then Colton noticed that the cabinet was not resting against the wall but was instead a few inches away from it. If he stood straight and held his breath, would it be possible for him to hide behind the cabinet? It was worth a shot. Colton took a deep breath, sucked in his stomach, and stood with his back flat to the wall. Inching sideways, he squeezed himself into the narrow space behind the cabinet. He had to turn his feet slightly sideways to make them fit. His grandmother was always telling him to stand up straight. Right now, he was standing straighter than he had ever stood, his spine pressed against the wall. The back of the cabinet was touching his chest, and if he hadn't sucked in his stomach, it would be touching him there too. Colton had never really been in a tight space before, so he had never really understood claustrophobia. He understood it now. Even though he knew rationally that he had plenty of access to oxygen, he still had the sensation of not being able to breathe. The space was too tight, too cramped. He remembered reading a story about a man who was trapped in a cave and slowly went mad. Even after only being in this tiny space for a couple of minutes, he understood how quickly his sanity could slip away if he had no means of escaping. But he was in control. He could leave his hiding place any time he wanted to. He was just choosing to stay there until closing time, because it was the only way for his plan to work. He could do this. And he had to admit to himself that it was an excellent hiding place. He surveyed all the dust, all the dust bunnies he was sharing the space with and stifled a sneeze. Even if they were sneeze-inducing, the dust bunnies were evidence that no one had moved this cabinet or even swept behind it in a long, long time. If he could stay still and sneezeless, he was going to be fine. Colton could hear the voices of Freddy's employees outside the storage room, then the noise of a vacuum cleaner. He let his mind drift to images of himself jumping up and down in the repaired ticket pulverizer, literally buried in tickets, claiming his richly deserved prize. Daydreaming helped pass the time helped distract from the physical discomfort of being pressed against a wall. Colton heard the door to the supply room being pushed open, then footsteps. I don't know why I've always got to be the one to clean the toilets, an irritated sounding female voice muttered. Brittany the princess thinks she's too good to clean the bathrooms. The footsteps approached the cabinet. Colton's heart pounded like a jackhammer. Colton heard both, uh, Colton both heard and felt the Freddy's employee open at the open the cabinet doors. If the back wall of the cabinet hadn't been separating them, she'd be close enough to touch him. Colton held his breath. Don't let her hear you breathe, he told himself. Okay, so spray cleaner and lots of toilet paper, the worker said. Because goodness knows, her royal highness Brittany couldn't lower herself to change a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> Someone's got a grudge against Brittany. Colton heard the cabinet door shut and the worker's footsteps walking away from him. The storage room was empty again. Colton exhaled. He let his mind drift. It could have been for a couple of minutes or an hour. He was losing track of time. But then he heard the flip of a switch and the room was plunged into darkness. A flashlight. Why had he not brought a flashlight? What if the entire restaurant was pitch black? How could he work on the ticket pulverizer then? Stupid, he chided himself. How could you be so stupid? Soon the noises of human movement outside the storage room faded and Freddy's fell silent. Colton slowly slid from behind the storage cabinet. His back hurt and his shoulders were stiff. It was a relief to stretch. The supply room was so dark he had to use the light from his phone to find his way to the door. He hoped that when he opened it he wouldn't be greeted by more darkness. The fluorescent lights in the game area had been turned off, but security lights on the ceiling, along with the colourful lights from the various token sucking games, still illuminated the arcade. The glow of the games in the dim room had an effect that was somewhat eerie, but at least Colton could see. He could do what he came here to do. 
Colton made his way to the ticket pulverizer. He unloaded his tools from the pockets and laid them out on the floor. He couldn't help but smile to himself. His plan had worked. He was in. He felt like an action hero. He had thought a lot about the mechanics of the ticket pulverizer and why it worked unfairly well for the little annoying brats. He figured out the platform was too, clo uh, too loose, too easy for them to push down. If he could tighten it up, make it more resistant, then the little brats couldn't make it budge and there would be more tickets for the older, bigger and more deserving. Colton fed four tokens into the ticket pulverizer to make the door open. Once he was inside, it didn't take him long to figure out where to tighten the platform. A few turns of the screwdriver on each corner, and the platform was much more rigid and required a lot more weight to move it. He was sorely tempted to, or sorrily, sorrily tempted, to feed in some more tokens and jump for tickets right then and there. But the jumping was noisy and he didn't want to do anything that might call attention to himself. He gave the platform a smell. Uh, smell? He gave the platform a small experimental push and whispered, Mission accomplished, before exiting the booth. But as he stood in the middle of the empty arcade, the reality of his situation dawned on him. His mission wasn't totally accomplished. He still needed to get out of Freddy's. He had spent so much time planning out how to get into Freddy's and work on the pulverizer that he had forgotten to plan how to get out. He had no exit strategy. Cotton looked around at the doors marked exit. He was sure each of them was equipped with a security alarm. He scanned the room frantically. Maybe there was a back door he could use, maybe in the kitchen. He walked through a dim hallway and pushed open the door to the kitchen. It was pitch black, so he held up his phone to light his way past the huge ovens and cooktops. Around the corner, he saw a door and felt a rush of relief. But when he looked up, he saw the security alarm. Colton's breath was short and ragged. He couldn't just stay here until Freddy's opened up again at 11 o'clock the next morning and say, Oops, guys, I guess I got locked in. Plus, if his mom got home from work in the morning and he wasn't there, she would panic. Think, Colton told himself, there has to be a way out. Colton thought back over all his visits to Freddy's. He had been coming to Freddy's since he was a loathsome little squeaker himself, so he knew the place well. He thought about the layout of the building. Finally, an image popped into his head. The restroom. Wasn't there a window in the men's restroom? The restroom was as dark as the kitchen. Colton held up his phone for enough light to make out the shapes of the sinks and stools. And yes, the window. It was a small window, too high up to access easily, but he could get to it if he stood on one of the chairs from the dining area. He'd have to leave the chair behind in the bathroom which wasn't ideal, but it was better than spending the whole night at Freddy's. He went back to the dining area, retrieved a chair, and carried it to the restroom. He set it under the window and climbed onto it. He was worried that the window wouldn't open, but it pushed up easily and no alarm sounded. Grunting with effort, he pulled himself through the opening and plummeted to the ground, landing on his hands and knees with an oof. <laughs> oof. Oof. <laughs> Some of Uncle Mike's tools fell from his pockets. He was a little shaken, but he was okay. Now all he had to do was gather up the tools and walk home like everything was normal. When his mom got home from her Saturday night shift, she'd find him in bed like nothing had happened. And tomorrow afternoon, he'd go back to Freddy's where he'd be the king of the ticket pulverizer. Colton had only $5 to take with him to Freddy's, but he figured that would be enough. $5 equaled 5 turns inside the ticket pulverizer, and by that time he'd be rolling in tickets. Once he got there, he didn't bother with the ball drop or the coin pusher. He made a beeline to the ticket pulverizer just in time to see a group of three little kids go inside, shrieking and giggling. He smiled to himself. This should be entertaining. Stupid squeakers don't suspect a thing. He watched the little kids gleefully jump up and down. Tickets poured down like water flowing from a faucet. How could that be? After the way he'd fixed it, their weight shouldn't have been enough to trigger such an outpouring of tickets. Colton seethed with rage. Maybe, though, he'd at least fix things so he would get a lot of the tickets, too. Maybe he had just turned the pulverizer into a machine that heaped tickets on anyone who went inside. As long as he got his fair share, he guessed that was okay. The little kids came out holding fat ribbons of tickets in their equally fat little fists. 
Colton elbowed his way past them. It was his turn. I'm assuming that he's going to get nothing. <laughs> I'm assuming that's how this story is going. He put four tokens into the slot and stepped into the ticket pulverizer. His heart was beating fast in anticipation. He knew this was it. This time he was going to get what he deserved. The lights in the sign reading jump for tickets started flashing. Colton jumped. In his mind, he was a jackrabbit, a kangaroo, any animal he could think of with strong legs and big feet and mighty jumping power. He jumped and jumped, but only a trickle of tickets fell. I told you, I told you. <laughs> how, could he, how could that be after all the planning, all the hard work that went into this heist? It didn't make sense. The madder he got, the harder he jumped. Only a few tickets drifted listlessly onto the floor. When time was up, he was so furious that he stomped out of the machine and left the tickets where they were. There weren't enough of them to do him any good anyway. On the walk home, his anger turned into dejection. Why did life have to be so unfair? Why did some people have so much while people like Colton and his mum had so little? It was just luck, wasn't it? Some people had good luck. Some people had bad luck. It was pretty obvious what kind of luck he had. But couldn't luck change? Surely there had to be some way to game the system. Back at the apartment, Colton's mum was humming to herself while she chopped onions. Tears were in her eyes from the smell, but she had the day off and seemed to be in a good mood. Colton sank into a kitchen chair. Hey, his mum said. I'm making sloppy joes. Have you ever thought about what a weird name that is for a sandwich? Like, was there actually a guy named Joe who looked really messy all the time? And then one day somebody said, hey Joe, we're naming a sandwich after you. And he was like, wow, that's great. But then it turned out they were calling them Sloppy Joes. And he was like, oh, wait, you're calling them what? Colton usually laughed at his mum's weird flights of fancy. But today he couldn't find the energy to respond. What's the matter, Colt? Not even a smile? His mum tapped him with a spatula. You usually think my tangents are funny. Corey shrugged. Corey? What? Who the hell is Corey? <laughs> Who is Corey? <laughs> oh no. Did, is that a misprint? That must be a misprint, right? Oh, damn it. Corey shrugged. Colt shrugged. Just not in a smiling mood, I guess. His mum sat down at the table across from him. Any particular reason you want to talk about? Not really. Just tired of seeing other people get what I deserve. People who don't deserve it, like little kids. They've not been around long enough to deserve anything. They've not paid their dues yet. They might as well still be in diapers. The more he thought about it, the angrier he felt. Rough time at Freddy's today, huh? His mum asked. Yeah, the stupid ticket pulverizer again, he said. He'd complained about it enough that his mum understood why he was talking about it. No luck with it? Colton shook his head. I'm never going to get enough tickets to get what I want. Well, I've been thinking about it, and you know, there are other ways of getting what you want, Mum said, pulling her hair back with the rubber band she kept around her wrist. Colton didn't think he liked his mum's tone. It was the same tone she used when she was about to nag him to do his homework or chores. What do you mean? Well, his mum said, I had a part-time job when I was your age. I worked at the Swirly Cone after school and on weekends making cones and shakes and Sundays. It didn't pay much, but the money adds up when you don't have any other expenses. Colton couldn't help but feel offended. Are you telling me I have to get a job? I already help Uncle Mike out two days a week. I'm not telling you that you have to. I'm just saying it's an option. If you worked, say, 10 to 15 hours a week, you could save up money to buy those luxury items I can't afford. If you keep throwing money at the ticket pulverizer, you'll have eventually spent more money trying to win tickets than that video game console costs anyway. Colton stood up from his chair. He was outraged. I can't believe you're making me get a job. I'm just a kid. Haven't you ever heard of child labour laws? <laughs> For goodness sake. His mum rolled her eyes. You are legally old enough to have a part-time job. Kids younger than you make money mowing lawns or doing odd jobs for people. There's no reason you couldn't do something like that. Or you could see if Mike would give you a few hours a week at minimum wage. It feels good to earn your own money, Colton. It's just something to think about. What's the point of having a cool video game console if you don't have time to play it because you're working all the time? Colton felt his voice getting louder. What a zoomer. 
If Dad was still here, we wouldn't have to worry about money. For a moment, his mum looked hurt, almost as if he had struck her. But then her expression shifted to irritation. No, we wouldn't. But he isn't here, so we have to do all the best we can. She got up from the table and went back to the stove. Dinner will be ready in 20 minutes. Between now and then, why don't you see if you can get over your bad mood? Colton didn't get over his bad mood. He lay in bed, playing the same scene over and over in his head. Those repulsive little kids laughing and cheering as an avalanche of tickets fell on them. He didn't understand why his attempt to fix the ticket pulverizer had failed. There had to be another way to do it. He got out of bed. He went to his desk and started making sketches of the machine. Screwing the platform in tighter hadn't been enough. He should have known it wasn't going to be that easy. To solve this problem, he was going to have to dig deeper. Colton had become obsessed with the ticket pulverizer. He looked up similar kinds of machines online trying to get a better understanding of their mechanics. Today, in shop class, he sat furiously sketching and making notes, as he had done in class every day for the past week. Mr. Harrison, the fatherly, balding shop teacher, leaned over his shoulder. Colton, you've been drawing and making notes for ages. What is it you're designing? Colton knew he wouldn't tell Mr. Harrison what he was really doing. He knew no adults would understand his obsession. Colton wasn't even sure he understood it himself, but he knew he couldn't stop until he finally experienced justice from the ticket pulverizer. It's more of a plan for fixing something, Colton said, still furiously sketching. Mr. Harrison raised an eyebrow. I can appreciate that, but you know that if you don't actually make something, I can't give you a grade, right? Right, Colton said, not looking up from his notebook. He was relieved when Mr. Harrison walked away to talk to other students. He didn't care if he got his grade or not. Right now, anything that didn't pertain to the ticket pulverizer felt like an unneeded interruption. That night, Colton brought his notebook with him to the dinner table. He sketched and wrote notes between bites of meatloaf and mashed potatoes and peas, which, due to his distraction, he didn't even really taste. I have Sunday off this weekend for the first time in ages, his mum said. I thought we might do something fun together. Maybe pack a picnic and drive up to the mountains, go on a little hike. We could stop on the way home for ice cream at that place you like. Mm-hmm, Colton said absently. He was aware that his mum was talking, but he hadn't actually processed any of her words. Colton, mum said. You're a million miles away and you have been for over a week now. What is it that you're working on day and night? She gestured at his notebook. It's, a, it's just a project for school, Colton mumbled, not looking up. Well, I hope it is, Mum said, pushing away her plate of half-eaten food. Because I ran into your English teacher yesterday and she says she's worried about you. She says that you've not been turning in your assignments and your grade has slipped to a low D. And D means danger, according to her. Is there a reason you're falling behind in your work? Colton finally looked up. If he didn't get his mum off his back, he wasn't going to be able to make his plan work. I'll talk to her tomorrow about what I need to do to catch up in class. His mum nodded. Okay, I know you don't like to talk about emotional stuff, but is there anything you need to say to me? Anything that's bothering you? She looked sad, as if she might cry, which Colton desperately hoped she wouldn't. I know since I work a lot of nights, it may feel like I'm not here when you need me, and I'm sorry for that. But where it counts, I am always here for you, Colton. She covered his hand with her own. Just don't shut me out, okay? Okay, Mom. Sheesh! <laughs> oh, sorry, I had to do it. <laughs> okay, Mom. Sheesh! Um, Colton drew his <laughs> Oh, Sorry. <clears throat> Let me calm down. That shouldn't have been as funny as it was. Colton drew his hand away. He was more than ready for his conversation to end. So, there's nothing you want to talk about? Nope. He went back to his sketching. Mom sighed and got up from her chair. Okay, I guess I'd better get ready for work. Will you load the dishwasher for me? Uh-huh. Colton said, forgetting the promise as soon as he had made it. Once his mum was gone, he left for Freddy's. He only had two bucks in his pocket, which wouldn't go very far in the arcade. 
but he wasn't there to play games. He was there to observe the ticket pulverizer. Cotton stood a few steps away from the machine that consumed his every waking hour. He looked at it as an enemy to be defeated, like in one of those Greek myths he had read in middle school. He was the hero and it was the monster. And the clown, the horrible gape-jawed clown, was like a dragon standing guard that he had to defeat before his big battle with the boss monster. He watched as group after group of loathsome little kids trooped into the machine and jumped up and down and stamped their tiny little feet while the tickets poured out. Not like a faucet, but like a waterfall. It was so unfair, it sickened him. A little girl with a blonde ponytail, who was maybe eight or nine years old, came marching up to him. Hey, why do you keep staring at the people inside the ticket pulverizer? She said. She pronounced the word pulverizer carefully, like she was sounding it out. Oh, that's really cute. Pulverizer. <laughs> Colton was incensed. How dare this little brat approach him and talk to him in such a judgmental way? Where were her parents? I'm not watching the people. I'm watching the machine, he said in a cold, measured tone. Well, my friend over there says you're creepy, the little girl said. Colton looked over at a dark-haired girl who was standing by the ticket pulverizer and staring at them as they talked. Her eyes were big and unblinking, and her gaze was penetrating. Tell your friend the feeling is mutual. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good response. Oh, clap and a half. Um, the little girl crinkled her nose. I don't even know what that means. If you don't know what it means, Colton said, deepening his voice in hopes of sounding adult and intimidating, then maybe that means you're not old enough to be starting conversations with somebody older than you. He made a shooting gesture as if he were a pesky, a pesky gnat. Go away. I'm happy to go away from you, the little girl said, turning her back on him and flouncing back to her friend. Good, then go, Colton muttered. The little girl was annoying, but she had told him something he needed to know. By scoping out the ticket pulverizer, he was calling unwanted attention to himself. If he was going to pull this off, he had to go unnoticed. He couldn't have horrible little girls noticing him and thinking he was creepy, and he certainly couldn't do anything to attract the attention of the Freddy staff. He needed to be invisible, silent and stealthy. Like a ninja, he reminded himself. <laughs> Colton walked away from the ticket pulverizer and toward the exit. He had seen what he had needed to see. By Friday night, Colton's plan was complete. This time he wouldn't do his work at night. He would work in daylight so he could see what he was doing. He would set his alarm for 6am and would sneak into Freddy's before it opened. He figured if he had successfully used the restroom window to sneak out, he could also use it to sneak in. Before he went to bed, he laid out his necessities, a dark shirt, his cargo pants, his phone, and the tools he would stuff in the pockets. And this time, even though it was day, uh, he was taking a flashlight. If he was going to go deep inside the dark innards of the ticket pulverizer, he needed to be able to see what he was doing. Colton laid in bed, wide awake, running through the heist over and over in his mind. The one thing that was worrying him was the bathroom window. He had used a chair for the boost he needed to get out of it, but how was he going to get into it? He couldn't exactly take a step without it with him and prop it against the building without practically announcing, Don't mind me folks, I'm just doing some breaking and entering here. He would just have to improvise. He'd get through the window somehow. Finally, excitement gave way to exhaustion. And Colton fell asleep. In his dreams, he jumped up and down on the pulverizer's... Um, platform and tickets cascaded over him until they were waist high then shoulder high in them. He was literally swimming in tickets. People watching him cheered. He had never felt so much joy. When the alarm went off his eyes flew open. This was it. Today was the day he was going to make it work. He took off his pyjamas and put on a dark shirt and cargo pants. He loaded the tools in his pockets and tightened his belt as an added precaution. He stopped in the kitchen and wolfed down a banana and chugged a glass of orange juice. He was ready. The streets were largely deserted at 6.30am, which was another reason Colton congratulated himself on the brilliance of his plan. No witnesses. Once he finished, finished? Once he reached the Freddy's building, he walked around the side and found the bathroom window. If he stood on tiptoe, he could just reach the windowsill with his fingertips. He groaned in disappointment. There was no way he had the upper body strength to pull himself up. He was going to have to find something to climb on. He walked further around the building. 
Next to the back door was a lidded garbage can on wheels. Perfect, Colton thought. The handle of the garbage can was sticky with something Colton didn't want to think about, but he hung onto it anyway and rolled the can onto the side of the building. The wheels made a little more noise than he would have liked, but there didn't seem to be anyone around to hear it. The position, or sorry, he positioned the garbage can right under the window and awkwardly climbed on top of it. The can's plastic lid warped under his weight and the wheels made him feel unsteady. But he pushed up the window, grabbed the, sti- grabbed the sill and started dragging himself through, head first. Soon he was awkwardly hanging with his hands in the sink and his feet still sick- sticking out the window. Not sure what else to do, he pushed his feet off the windowsill and flipped forward, hitting the floor hard on his backside. It didn't tickle, and the wind was knocked out of him, but he wasn't injured. And most important, he was in. He pulled himself clumsily to his feet and waited for a minute for his breathing to return to normal. How was it that in the movies people could jump from a great height, land hard, and then hop right up and keep on running? Because it's a movie. (laughs) When Colton swung open the bathroom door, the clown animatronic was standing in the hallway, almost as if it had been waiting for him. Colton jumped backward, uh, his heart beating fast. Yeesh! (laughs) He said, looking at the thing's horrible, gape-mouthed grin. Shouldn't somebody put you away at night? He squeezed past the clown, fearful that it might grab him. But it just stood there like the inanimate object it was. Still, when Colton walked down the hallway, it was hard not to look back to see if the clown was following him. Colton didn't think he'd ever get used to this silent version of Freddy's. No screaming rugrats, no bleeping games, no pre-recorded songs and chatter from Freddy's animatronic band. It was quieter than the library. Then Colton heard a faint jingling. Or at least he thought he did. It was the soft, tingly noise that the bells on the birthday clown's costume would make. Was the clown following him? Colton had to laugh at himself. Of course the clown wasn't following him. It was a machine, a thing. He was no more capable of stalking somebody than a vacuum cleaner. He heard the jingling again, closer this time. He ducked behind Bibi's bull drop and listened for the bells. He heard nothing. When he stepped out from behind the machine, he saw the clown. It was at the end of the row of games with the back turned to him. Colton hurried as quietly as he could in the opposite direction. Jingle, jingle. The clown was on the move again. Colton squatted ba- down beside Dee Dee's fishing game. His heart was pounding in his chest. He held his breath as the clown shambled past him, bells tinkling. It's not looking for- good for you, Colton told himself. Stop acting like a stupid squeaker. You can't get all spooked by a dumb fake clown and lose the opportunity that's right there for the taking. You know why you came here. He made his way to the ticket pulverizer. When he got there, the clown was standing in front of the machine, as if it were guarding it. But when Colton waved his hands in front of the clown's eyes, it didn't react at all. One eye looked ahead and one looked down and off to the right, like always. And of course, they weren't really looking anyway, Colton told himself. The clown's eyes were as unseeing as the button eyes on Colton's childhood teddy bear. He couldn't let the creepy clown distract him from his mission. Colton stared at the ticket pulverizer, its lights flashed and glowed. It felt like an enemy issuing a challenge. But soon, Colton thought, he would tame the ticket pulverizer, and it would be a faithful friend, giving him the rewards he so richly deserved. He walked around the machine, surveying its base. On one side, he spotted what looked like the larger version of a battery compartment cover on the TV remote control. If he could get that cover open, he might be able to squeeze into the base of the machine to tinker with its workings. Colton dug through his pockets to find the tools he needed. He set out his phone, a screwdriver, and a flashlight. Colton felt a hand on his shoulder, but it wasn't a normal human hand. He looked down to see a large three-fingered white glove connected to telltale yellow coils. 